we know when the, the final thing is over? It might be, because usually it's <laughs> about break, spring break time, they, they bail out. Today I want to discuss homework number six, which you have all okay. turned in, I have graded. Homework number seven, which you are hard at work on. And then a few other items uh, as they may come to mind. I don't know if we'll get back to the response today or not. Let's see how we go. With respect to homework number six, uh, and I have two official solutions, which I will identify uh, for Michael. Uh, I wanted to point out two things. I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, reversal versus divergence. I mean, this homework was nominally about reversal, right? But some of you discovered, I'm not sure you really knew what you were seeing, some of you discovered divergence as well. And then the other thing I want to talk about is the convergence of the mode series. You're using daily lists with the first numbers of modes. And I want to point out that convergence depends on the situation. For the constant population, one mode was really good. For the variable population, one mode was not quite as good. It was, it was in the ballpark. But you really needed to get, uh, to get an accurate answer, you needed more modes for the variable property case. Which you would expect, right? At least I would expect. Okay, so let me uh, point out uh, a couple of things. And this, these are drawn from uh, Jan Dries. Oh, he, he's, he's guilty of providing a home solution. Uh, and here is a table. And uh, for various numbers of modes, so n is the number of modes, q is the reversal q. And there are mathematically several reversal cues, but the first one is like conversion, the first one win. Although in principle, I wouldn't recommend this. In principle, you can fly through reversal, the first reversal, and keep flying, right? And then fly through, <clears throat> I don't think anyone would want to do that, but divergence is an instability that leads to very large reflections, which probably will damage the structure and perhaps lead to the loss of the airplane. Reversal, it's just very disconcerting. If you're expecting to get a slip of one side and it's reversed, that means you'll get lift of another side. And if you're right at the reversal condition, by definition, that's when the lift is zero, which means you're not going to get lift at all. So you lose control of certain factors. Anyway, uh, these were the answers um, from the exact solution, which I think was homework number five. And these are the answers from homework number six. And as you can see, as we go from uh, uh, one mode to two, three, to four, there's virtually no change in, in the reversal cues. And that's also true not only for E over C equals 0.1, but also <coughs> for E over C equals 1. But E over C equals 1 turns out to be interesting because if you look carefully at E over C equals 1, you have divergence before you get reversal, which means <clears throat> in practical terms, if this were a real airplane, you'd never get reversal, right? Because you would have diverged first. But we'll see that in a moment. Then, uh, let's see. Uh, I'm trying to remember whether it was in this one or the next one. Yeah, it's in this one. Um, <coughs> so, the other way, these were passed on the hand of the results from the constant Q, G, J case in the form of a table, which is okay. But then, when we did variable in J, you made a graph, yeah. which was okay too, right? You can present it in a table, you can present a graph. So here are some results for the reversal Q versus the number of modes. As you can barely see, there's, there's a line here as well, for different values of E over C, right? And as you can see, you need more modes for the variable case, for the variable GJ case, than you did for the constant GJ, which should not be a surprise to you. I hope. Now, John Batana? He's not here. Well, he, he's not going to get credit. I'll take it. Okay. <laughs> okay. 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 Is that the way you pronounce it? David? David. David. Okay. Anyway, if he were here, he would point out that he, he did something else. I, I think in Jan's case, we just found the, the diversion, or excuse me, the reversal cube. But but uh, Tabitha actually plotted lift versus Q for various cases, okay? And this is a case, uh, I think 
think this is the constant GJ case. This is for E over C equals 1. Okay? And if you plot the lift versus Q, here's 0. So the reversal is over here when this changes time. But in some sense, it reverses before that because there is a change in time of the lift. But the lift goes off to infinity, positive infinity in this case, and comes back from negative infinity. What's the divergence value? And that's the divergence. Yeah, what is the, what's the numeric value? Well, it, it, according to his chart, if I can take my glasses, I can read it. It looks like it's about 2.4. Okay. And we can compare that to truth. Because we did a divergence calculation for a uniform mean some time ago. And I think we found that Q, E over C is 1, so it doesn't matter whether you normalize Q by C or E, because E over C is 1, right? Q was pi over 2 squared, and pi over 2 squared is 2.56, which isn't quite what he got, but it's close enough. And maybe, maybe if, he, he, he put the vertical line here, but maybe the vertical line really is over at 2.56 or pi over 2 squared. It's not very good. Yeah. So, so divergence occurred when E over C was large. It wouldn't occur with, remember, divergence doesn't occur for E over C equals 0. If you remember that. It doesn't occur for negative E over C. But when the E over C gets large enough, that drops the divergence cube. And in this case, it drops it well below the reversal cube. And that can happen. So when you're doing a static or electric analysis, you need to do have a consideration of it. I didn't actually know that that was going to happen, but I think I should take credit for it. That, that's a good thing to happen. I remind you that virgin can happen. Okay. Uh, oh, here it is. So, any questions about homework number six? Okay. All right. So let's talk about homework number seven, which is due on Thursday. And you've all been working hard on that, and even the folks in Stockholm have been working hard on that. And again, I should probably take credit for something that was really an end room. But I really didn't give you, looking back on it, very clear instructions. So now I'm going to give instructions. Uh, but the fact that I gave you unclear instructions led you down a primrose path. You know about primrose path? Primrose path is a... Why is a primrose path a bad path? It's a bad path. I'm not saying from, from Shakespeare or some, some literary illusion. Anyway, it looks, looks beautiful, but doesn't end up... Yeah, maybe that's it. Ah, oh, very good. That's the primrose path. Okay. So I think my my uh, there you go. So I think my imprecise instructions led you astray. But sometimes you learn more by going down the wrong path, or at least a non effective path. So let me remind you. This is uh, March third. Um, let me remind you of what homework number seven is all about. First of all, I said we have kinetic energy. Which is M H dot squared plus two S alpha H dot alpha dot plus I alpha alpha dot squared D one and then U was one half the integral from zero to L of of E I secondary of H with respect to Y squared D Y. That's the bending contribution. And then there's a torsional contribution. And then there's um, virtual work, which is the integral of zero L M Y L alpha D Y minus because of the sign convention here comes zero L H L H D Y. Right? I think I called these equations one and two. Right? And 
in there, I said, I think most people have got this part. Find the equations of motion. I think you got it because I wrote down the equations of motion. <laughs> you do what you're looking for. Find the equations of motion. And the boundary conditions, which I didn't give you. And I didn't give those to you because I want you to do a little work and make sure you uh, knew uh, all about Hamilton's principle. And to do that, you're going to use Hamilton's principle. Right? And when you did that, I think most people have been doing this, um, you get the following. You get M H double dot dot L in time derivatives plus S alpha alpha double dot plus the second derivative with respect to Y of EI, this is allowing for EI, which might depend on Y, uh, second derivative of H with respect to Y equals minus L. That's one equation of motion. The other equation of motion is uh, I alpha alpha double dot plus S alpha H double dot. Note the symmetry of the coupling between the two equations. That's not accidental. That always happens if you have energies, kinetic and potential energies of this one, plus partial respect of y of gj, which also might depend on y, partial alpha respect of y equals m sub y. Okay? I think most people did that. So let me pause. Did most people do that? And are you comfortable with that part, even though you haven't added in the homework yet? Yeah, I think I think that's okay. I think where I led you astray is I then said, let's use Rayleigh Ritz and do a quarter analysis. And these equations of motion are, are not what you use when you use Rayleigh Ritz. When you use Rayleigh Ritz, you take the assumed form of the solution and plug it back into these equations. Derive uh, some expressions which then allow you to invoke Lagrange's equations, which then allow you to lead, allow you to lead to molar equations of motion, which then allows you to do a flutter analysis. And I think some people thought you had to use these equations and you got in trouble. But you learned something. I learned something, I guess. So, so this, this is sort of part one, if you will, of the homework. Part two was use Rayleigh Ritz to obtain a flutter solution. And what does that mean? Well, in the case of H, a function of time, I'm, uh, oops, it's not just a function of time. More importantly, or equally importantly, it's a function of y as well, right? I'm going to assume that h is h hat of t, which I don't know yet, but I hope it's determined. And then I'm going to assume the dependence on y in the spirit of, of assumed modes, right? And I said, I'm going to, I'm going to, well, this is not such a term of shy. I'm going to allow you to use this very simple mode shape. Which isn't, isn't the natural mode of the system. It's certainly not the flutter mode of the system. It's a mode that, what? It's a mode that satisfies the geometric bound conditions at the root. Namely, that h is zero at the root, and the derivative of h with respect to y is zero at the root. Similarly, alpha is alpha hat of t times y upon l. This is Linear, this is quadratic. It's linear because all I have by way of a geometric bound condition of root on alpha is that alpha is zero. I don't know anything about d alpha dy. In fact, d alpha dy is definitely not zero to me. Both physically and mathematically. Okay, now, here's where I think most people got in trouble. Let's see, I'm going to call this equation six and seven. If I take six and seven and put them in four and five and try to use the Lurfus method or some other method, I'm not going to get a good answer. Why not? Well, let's see. If, uh, let's just consider the special case where EI and GJ are constant. 
I have the fourth derivative now of h, and I have the second derivative of alpha. The, if I assume this form, the fourth derivative of h with respect to y is zero. <laughs> the second derivative of alpha with respect to y, if I assume this form is zero. Okay. And so, using Galerka's method, which involves we'll taking this and putting it in the difference equation, and then maybe multiplying through by these modes, change it, integrate, and do all that good stuff. Well, if I had chosen a better set of modes, that would probably give me a decent answer. But the price of using these simple modes is the collection is not going to do the job. On the other hand, if I take these things and put them back in one, two, and three, I'll get a decent answer. Not a wonderful answer in terms of the sort of velocity will determine the force of the figure. So it won't be that good, right? That would require better modes or more modes or both. And I'll get a decent answer, I think. I haven't done it. That's why you're doing the homework. I think you I've done some of some of the past. I think you'll get a decent answer if you take six and seven, put them back in the one, two, and three. And then derive the equations for h hat and alpha hat. Because once I substitute this into one, two, and three and do the integration over y, which I can now do, right? I will have T U and uh, and also the virtual work expressed entirely in terms of functions of time, and the y dependence will have gone away by virtue of having seen this form. Then I can use Lagrange's equations to determine the equations of motion for h hat and and out there, right? So the recipe, the the proper path is take six and seven, substitute into one, two, and three. And by the way, you also have to you also have to use expressions for the, the moment about the elastic axis, was it the left times E and the left is given in terms of H dot and alpha, right, and all that good stuff. I think I think I actually I'm allowing you to in this term work don't want to assume that the lift depends on alpha and not H dot, which will simplify your arithmetic. Okay. So then um, then use Lagrange's equations for H hat, which only depends on time, and alpha hat, which only depends on time, to determine equations of motion in terms of those lines, right? To determine Or H hat alpha. So what have we done? I mean, fundamentally, what we've done is by assuming this form, we've taken what are partial difference equations for H and alpha in terms of their terms on Y and T, and we'll we'll have by assuming this form and using greater risk than Lagrange equation, we will reduce that model to a set of ordinary difference equations only in things which depend on time in the H hat and alpha. So we made that's the key. We made a reduction. That's a good thing. Because fundamentally we only know how to solve PDEs by reducing them using some method to ordinary difference equations. Think about that. Let us find out differences, mole analysis, finite volume, whatever it is. That's how you solve PDE. So now with this point you've got some ordinary difference equations and H hat alpha. And now you're almost ready to do a flutter analysis. And what are you going to do then? Well, let me stop. Before I go to the next step. Pause. Question. We're okay? Okay. Okay. Now, <laughs> I've got these equations of H hat and alpha hat. And I'm going to assume now that that depends on time. is some unknown H bar times e to the beta t, and alpha bar e to the beta t. So these are equations A. What will this do? This will take these ordinary difference equations in time and reduce them to algebraic equations. So it's a linear model, so all the factors e to the beta t are going to cancel out. But by virtue of having time derivations like time, I'll get some betas. In fact, I, in this case, I'll get just beta squared. So now I'm going to end up with a set of 
equations which will which in liquid form I can write like this. It's going to be something times h h bar alpha bar equals zero zero, right? That's the form. Note that I haven't told you what those are. You, you got to do something, right? Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to give you a nice grade. But now I want non-trivial solutions for h bar and alpha bar. I, but one possible solution to this sort of equation will be that they're zero, right? But the non-trivial solution, which will allow me to assess whether the system is stable or not, will be when h bar and alpha bar are not zero, possibly not zero. And that will occur when this determinant of this coefficient is zero. So when I set the determinant of the matrix of coefficients to zero, there's a two by two determinant, so when I multiply out, it will be a polynomial in theta, or actually theta squared. This will give me a polynomial in theta squared. I can solve for theta squared as a function of q, or any other parameter I like, but normally we would specify all the other ones and parameters and find theta squared as a function of, of q. Um, well, I know base squared as long as I can see that I can take a square root. I can find theta <laughs> as a function of q. And theta in general is a complex number with a real part and an imaginary part. And this is the part that tells me whether things are exponentially growing or decaying, the sign of it. And this tells me the frequency at which it oscillates. Okay? And if I assume that lift is the form Q, C, D, C, L, D alpha times alpha only, okay, then I can readily uh, Write down what, what the sentence of, what qualitatively, what the sentence of beta of Q will look like. And I'm going to do that on the next page. But I'm going to wait a moment while you ask questions. Okay. Yes, yeah. oh, okay. you first and then you, okay, go ahead. Um, can I repeat again about the real part of beta? Yes. So, so the real part of beta determines whether the system is stable or unstable. Because if beta R is positive, then the solution is the form e to the beta r t times e to the i beta i t. Because of this i, this is just an oscillatory part. But this part either exponentially grows or decays. And if this is true, then that's what the system is unstable. And if beta r is less than zero, no flood. Oh, sorry. Thank you. Of course, that begs the question, what happens if beta r is a negative zero? And it turns out that for this particular case, if I use this particularly simple expression for the aerodynamic force, sometimes beta r is identically zero for quite an extended range of q. But I'm going to talk about that in a moment. You had a question. If you beta is a question of beta, are you dimensional? Well, I think in the whole problem, I actually give you some dimensional variables, right? Yeah. So the Q will be in, I think the way it'll work out is in probably pounds per inch squared. Yeah. That's right. Having said that, this is part of the homework, I think I ask you, once you compute the dimensional Q, you can compute a non-dimensional Q, right? And I think that's interesting. Interesting. And I'll explain why in a moment. Other questions before I sketch out what beta versus Q looks like? This can involve a Fourier transform. Don't have to use a Fourier transform. Okay. I could, but I don't have to do a current out. I don't have to use it. Okay. I, I, I do want to use it when I do a test or something. But not. It has its place, but not in current out, as usual. Okay. Ready? Okay. Here's what. Here's what the sense of beta on Q looks like. So I'm going to plot beta real 
versus Q here, and beta imaginary versus Q here. When Q is zero, there isn't any error in dynamics, right? When Q is zero, the left is zero, and there, we just have inertia and stiffness, or potential energy and kinetic energy. So, um, it turns out this is a, a second order system, but in two degrees of freedom. So, two times two equals four. You see, we use the advanced mathematics. It's two times two equals four. So, there are four roots, right? And they appear in complex conjugate pairs. So, there's one here, and there's one here, and there's one here, and one here. And these two are mirror images, mirror images of those two. This is true, actually, in, in more general terms, but it's strictly true for this simple case. Because they're mirror images, normally people don't plot the negative values of beta i. When you see a paper in the literature, they normally don't do this. But they're there. They shouldn't bother to plot them. Okay. And then, because when q is zero, of course, the root part, I shouldn't say of course, but it is zero. There's no damping in the system. Actually, there's no damping in the system for quite some time. Anyway. All four, there are four roots, right? There's one, two, three, the four roots, four real parts, all of which are zero. Okay? And that, for this simple aerodynamic model that I allow you to use, up to a certain Q, that's still true. The real parts will be identically zero. So, they'll just continue on up to this point. And what's magic about this point? What's magic? What magic? I'm sorry? A hot bifurcation. There's a hot bifurcation, that's right. That's what the mathematicians say, and even engineers have adopted that language. It's also also known as the flutter point. <laughs> what what happens in this case is this frequency, the imagined part, goes down, and this one goes up, and they meet right where this point occurs, and then they stay together. And typically they go up. They could go down, but typically they go up. What happens on the real part is two of these real parts go up and two of them go down. So two of them are negative, two of them are positive. And you say from the example, like uh, tissues that go positive to this would have the same values and the two that go negative is two. Yes. Right. Yeah, so there's there are really two here and there are two there. Uh, again, normally people don't pause and say that because if they if they'll stress this, then one goes up and one goes down, right? Because everything's a mirror image. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. See, the, the, the two that go up, uh, one of them associated with one of these rules, they don't associate with Okay. But this is positive, this is negative, positive, negative. The plus and minus on the magic part is really just a phase shift. Right, and it doesn't really mean anything particularly physically. Um, but the, the the positive negative side of big R is, is the whole story, really. It's, it's when one root this takes one, that's usually there are two. It just takes one root to have a positive base of R, and that means the system is unstable. So if I have four roots and only one of them has a positive beta R, the system is still important. What that would mean physically is that uh, you know, it, it, the, these betas are basically eigenvalues, right? And there's an eigenvector, that is, there's a ratio of each part of alpha bar that you can also determine from the mathematics. If you go back to linear algebra. And what that really tells you is that there are certain characteristic eigenvectors that go along with these eigenvalues. And if I were to, to try, if I were to use Fourier transform so I could do the initial value problem and start off the initial set of values and what time has they evolved. Eventually, because one of them is unstable, that motion would dominate, right? And I would just see that motion. And the other characteristic motions associated with the other eyebrows would all be stable and they would they would damp away. And you see the unstable. Okay. Uh, normally in flood analysis, people are interested in this point, right? But sometimes they're interested in also knowing what the motion looks like. And they certainly want to know what the frequency is. Because if they're going to do an experiment in the windmill or flight test, they want to make sure that not only did they get a reasonable prediction of the Q as the flight occurs, but also a reasonable prediction of the frequency, because that gives them greater assurance they really understand the physical phenomena involved. And if they're really careful, they'll actually look at the characteristic shape, 
measure the most shape, and this thing is long enough to flood it. Although, if you have a very expensive airplane or a very expensive wind tunnel model, you don't go very far beyond the flooded point. Right. Because you don't want to lose the airplane or lose the wind tunnel. And both have happened. And the wind tunnel? Lose the wind tunnel? Lose the, wind tunnel? Lose the model in the wind tunnel. Oh, I didn't mean it's like, it's like lose the wind tunnel. No, no, you don't. Well, you can lose the wind tunnel in a point of sense. The model breaks up. It goes downstream, it hits the fans, uh, damages the fans, and six months later, and multiplying millions of dollars later, the wind tunnel is ready to use it. So you can lose the wind tunnel, probably not permanently, but for a significant amount of time and, and a significant cost to get it back on the Yes. That has happened. That has happened. That's not a good day when it happens. <laughs> Job security, right? Well, uh, well, it's not not for the flight engineers because they can't they don't have a wind tunnel to play with, right? And maybe it's for the mechanics who are carrying the plane. Okay, now um, this is all true. This is what happens when L is Q C B C L E L for times L. I'll make that as a solid line. I will now just tell you this, although I didn't actually do this before. Here's what happens if you have Q C D, C, L, D, alpha, and now I put alpha, and then I put, put the term H dot over U, which people have been known to do. Okay? Remember, that's the term we included in uh, just response, right? Because we want to have some damping in our system. So if we put a term like this for, to provide damping, then what happens is as follows. All four of these roots still start out at zero because it's zero, two. This term is also not considered, right? Okay? But then, as soon as we go get to any finite cube, all of these things become non-zero, and normally they all become negative, indicating that all the roots are initially stable for small cubes. So there's one going down like this, there's another one going down like this, and so forth and so on. Uh, <coughs> okay, but then as Q increases, that downward trend reverses. And you get something like this. And here, here's the new flutter form. Note that I've really shown this as a case where adding H dot actually decreased the flutter key, which is not unknown in flutter analysis. Usually it doesn't decrease it much. There are other cases where it actually increases it. It depends on all the other parameters in the model, right? Okay. But, uh, so that happens. And then the other thing that happens is these two frequencies never quite get together. They, they come close. I'll go up like this. They come close. And then this one goes up. So they head toward each other. But then typically this one goes like this and this one goes like this. They never quite get together because of the day. In fact, they're probably closer than I've shown them, but I've shown them somewhat this day, so you'll get the idea. Uh, and you could do this. Uh, that wouldn't be terribly involved. The nice thing about leaving it out is it's a two degree freedom system and you have a you'll have a quartic solution but it's really a quadratic and basic square so you can use the quadratic formulas and actually analytically extract the eigenvalue. If I put this term in, I'll have when I set that determine to zero determine the basis, there'll be a quartic, which will have four boots, and there'll be a Beta to the fourth term, there'll be a beta cube term, there'll be a beta squared term, and there'll be a beta term, so as well as the constant term. So then you, you cannot solve a quartic analytically. You have to go to MATLAB and say, here are my coefficients of my quartic equation. Please find the four roots and tell me what they are so I can plot them. Okay. So that's why I didn't ask you to do that. That wouldn't be. Yeah, maybe in the next one. Um, so does, does that give you enough to, to chew on and do the homework? No, okay. As I say, I should take care of misleading you so you would have a learning experience, but I, I really just didn't explain the curve because I'm not that. Yes, you have a question? Can you pull that uh, last graph back up? Oh, good graph. Uh, the one you just did. Which one? Which one? Yeah. yeah. So just, just like, it's not a major point, but if you add damping, you know, the imaginary part is the frequency, right? Yeah. Is it possible that if you add damping, the frequency, the natural frequency can increase? Okay. Normally, the damping term doesn't change the beta i very much, except very near the flutter point, which prevents the two frequencies 
from coming together. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And as I say, I've exaggerated the difference between the saw line, the dash line, the sort of data is concerned. Normally they're very close together. Okay. But they're not right on top of each other. The big effect of these dots is on the real part. <laughs> so there is some, even in a spring mass damper system, the damping changes the natural frequency. Yeah, yeah, but you remember, I think it increases it. Well, it, it goes down. from, uh, increases it. No, I think it decreases it. Yeah, yeah, I think it, I think it decreases it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, uh, yeah, it doesn't, Increase pretty much for typical patterns of damping. The more interesting thing for most people is the fact that the damping can actually increase or decrease the particle. Yeah. And when people see a decrease in the particle, you know, what does that mean? How can damping decrease particle? Well, it can. At least in the math model. Okay. We're all, all set then? All right. We'll go forth and do great things. Now, having said all of that, again, this is part of the learning space, I'm going to briefly describe the homework I did not ask you to do, but could have. And we'd be happy to do so if there's an enthusiasm for it. We could do what some of you attempted to do. We could go back to those equations of motion that we derived, that you derived from Hamlin's principle, and attempt to solve those equations exactly. Not not using many risks, not using some modal assumption, solve those PDE, those partial difference equations, exactly. That has been done. It was first done in about 1944, maybe 45. So, right. so there's not an opportunity to be famous by doing it yourself. But you should be aware of it because it's a famous case. And it was done at the time to follow. And by the way, the person that did it, Martin Golan, not only did it, he did it using the full Theodorson unsteady theory of aerodynamics, not using our simplified aerodynamics, the full Theodorson theory. The Theodorson theory is two-dimensional unsteady incompressible flow, but within the framework of a linear fluid model, it's the whole story. It was the first famous solution in unsteady aerodynamics circa 1935, with it about. And then about 10 years later, go on to the how to Use it and to get an exact solution to that those equations. Yeah. Yeah. Did he do it numerically? Oh, I don't know. Well, it's numerical in a sense. I'll describe what he did. And there's a certain amount of numerics. Since this is 1945, you didn't use a MATLAB. Yeah, you didn't use MATLAB. You didn't use uh, you know, your, your favorite personal computer, which you could do today. Not in 1945. Um, anyway, here's the idea. Uh, let's go back to equations four and five. Okay? Let's go back to equations four and five. Uh, and so I'm going to write these again so I'll have them in front of me and you'll have them in front of me. I'm going to rewrite the equations four and five again. And tell you what Martin Golan did. Martin Golan, many years later, he was a Famous guy at the time. He became the uh, president of the Southwest Research Institute. I don't even know what that is, but that's one of the premier applied research you know, organizations in the United States. And has always had a history of doing a lot of aerospace work, but they do the same thing. Anyway, M H double dot plus um, S alpha, alpha double dot. And he did this for the case of constant EI and constant GJ. He didn't do it for arbitrary that EI. Yeah, as far as I know, no one's ever done that. Um, so EI, now, fourth derivative of H with respect to Y equals, I'll just call it uh, minus L. And I'll even, I'll even show you what L looks like in a moment. Full Theodorson theory. I'm going to write, it's in my book. I won't write the full thing. I don't keep commit that to memory. But I'll give you an indication of how complicated it is. I alpha, alpha number nine. S alpha H double dot plus G J second derivative of alpha respect to Y equals M sub Y. And L is uh, the density of the fluid times the coarse squared, I think, 
times two the double dot. There's a term like this that comes from from the lift because in an incompressible flow, the, the fluid attached to a moving body acts like an additional inertia, at least at very high frequency. And then there's another term. I, well, there's an alpha double dot term. There's an H dot term, there's an alpha dot term, and then there's plus C, this is the symbol of Theodorus and Eutychus. It's called the Theodorus function, which is a function of omega C over U. That's the famous reduced frequency. Uh, and then it's uh, H dot alpha, some other things, okay? C is known in terms of ankle functions. You know what ankle function is? It's a cousin to a um, to a vessel function. That's an ankle function. And uh, it's known analytically in, in terms of ankle function. And he found this solution using complex variable theory. So he has the function. He took that course in complex variable theory and wondered what the ankle well, average is. Well, he had also solved this problem using complex variable theory. Well, here's the problem. These Henkel functions depend on the reduced frequency, right? So, what do I mean by frequency? Well, when we assume a solution of a form, we're going to assume the solution of the form H, the function Y and P. To do flare analysis, we're now going to do H bar, I'm going to call it H bar of Y. And I'm going to assume that the Y dependence is going to be a type. But I'm going to use E to the beta T. Okay. But beta, as we know, is the real part plus an aggregate part. That base of I is this frequency which appears in the unplayed air down theory. As great a man as Theodore Orson was, he only found a solution for the case where beta R is strictly zero. And beta i is not. But that's all you need to find the flutter point. It doesn't allow you to find what happens below or above the flutter point. Except that later, maybe several decades later, people discovered that if you just naively replace uh, omega, with the full solution, the full form of beta, Theodorson's theory still works, providing you take the right branch in the complex field. Okay, but that's a different story. What, what uh, Golan did was he assumed that he was right at the flutter point. Okay. And then found the combination of Q and omega which satisfied the eigenvalue problem. That's what he did. Now, he had to do one other thing. He had to find the dependence of H bar on Y. So how did he do that? He used the method that you learned in your course in ordinary difference equations. Once he assumed this form, he assumed that H bar of Y has the form of E to the gamma Y. Where you now have to determine the possible values of gamma. Okay? So think about that. What he's going to end up with is a, a difference equation, which then, using this form, allows you to write a set of algebraic equations, <clears throat> where he has to determine these possible values of gamma. So he, he picks the omega, and he picks the Q, he determines the values of gamma, it turns out there, there are four values of gamma associated with H, and two associated with alpha, because the equation for H is fourth order, the equation for alpha is second order. So you had to find six values of, alpha, uh, of gamma, effectively. And then he had to work out all that algebra and found out that solution. Now, I know you probably want to really get into the details of all that, right? And so you, if you do, you can look up Dr. Golan's original paper, or there is a more recent paper. Finally, this is 2009. I think I mentioned this before earlier. I had a student uh, here who, who, who basically thought this was a neat thing to do. So his his uh, his paper is the following problem. Here's what Golan did, right? Looking edge on to the way. 
what this student did was put to do a two-segment wing, a folding wing, if you will. And you can use the same method. In fact, you can use that in principle for as many segments as you like. But obviously, the algebra gets more and more tedious as you add more and more segments. But again, what's the value of doing that? The value of doing that is if I have some sort of an approximate solution method, if I have an exact solution, then I have a benchmark to compare to. Because particularly as you get to more complex geometries, you may get some results that look a little strange. Is that right? <laughs> did I did I do that calculation right or not? So I'll, I'll uh, let's, let's share this again. Just
let's uh, now return to depth analysis. Turn the gun and let me just remind you of what happened. We were looking at, a, at at our wonderful wing. We were content to look at the bending of it only, although in a real up, real hole up, just now so you might have bending, torsion, all sorts of things, and multiple modes in bending, and multiple modes in torsion. But the dominant mode usually is for spending, and in our simplified discussion at this point, we just looked at one bending. Okay? And so what we ended up with then was we were going to assume that we had a gust velocity, which depended on time, and we assumed that it was going to be a sinusoidal dependence on time with a certain frequency. And because we have a linear model, it's fair to assume that H, which depends on Y and T, uh, is some uh, H bar E to the I omega T times some function of Y. And I think in our analysis, we just left it. And because we just, we weren't doing any numerics at that point. We just left some, some function that we think will do the job. But formally, then, we're going to end up with a, Single equation that relates to H bar to WT bar, and therefore we can compute a transfer function. And we did that in non dimensional form. So H bar is normalized by, not normalized by C or L. Remember now. Wow, I better go back and look. Mm, I don't think I brought it with me. Does anyone remember? I don't. Hmm. It really doesn't matter, except it probably would be good to be consistent with my previous notes. And WG, of course, we're going to normalize by the oncoming. Anyway, I'm going to call that. What's my C? Thank you. So this is the, this this ratio is some function of frequency. Okay, but it's independent of H bar and, and WG bar because it's a linear relationship. So all all of this included in here are things like the mass of the wing and the stiffness of the wing and just bending mode and dynamic pressure will flow and so Okay. <clears throat> then we said, well, but if you want to, now I can use the idea of a Fourier transform. I was thinking of sinusoidal inputs and outputs. But I would get the same relationship and the same transfer function if I formally took a full transform of, of the equation of motion. And now if I want to know H as a function of time normalized by C, it's the interval from 0 to T of, of some function I, which depends on T minus tau, WG tau normalized by U, T tau. And uh, I of T is equal to 1 over 2 pi, the interval minus infinity to plus infinity of the transfer function, e to the plus I omega T D omega. Okay. This is the Fourier transform, or the transfer function. And this is the inverse Fourier transform called the impulse function. Let's call it impulse function because I think I mentioned if you take a delta function for this factor, then the I equals H. So one way to find H is put an impulse into my system, either experimentally or computationally, and look at the response. Now, and for a linear model, this is the whole story. Well, what's one important caveat? Uh, when I worked out the details, I used some simplified aerodynamic theory. We still haven't looked at a real aerodynamic theory. But <clears throat> that aside, if I had used the, the best available aerodynamic theory, the one that I thought would do the job, you would still end up with a relationship like this is just that the transfer function would be more elaborate. If I use the Orson theory, the transfer function would depend on cancel function. Okay. That's not a showstopper, but it makes life a little more complicated than I do the transfer function. 
Okay. So I can do all that. Having said that, there's another approach, which is commonly used by industry and by other folks, including people in surgery. And that is based on what is usually called random gust analysis. So let's talk a little bit about random gust analysis. Uh, I'm, I may not want to know all the details of the time history. I might be perfectly satisfied to know, given the mean time history of the stress, what is the mean time history of the response? It turns out that's the same as the static, looking at the static gust and the static response. So if I just want the mean, the, the time average, and that's all I want to know, it's just a static analysis. So I just put put in a static time average of the gust, and I get a static time average of the response, and that's how it's done. But then what I often want is something a little more than that, but not the entire time history. I might want to know the mean square fluctuations about the mean. Okay? And that turns out to be a, an entirely different pattern and a much more elaborate story. Okay. So let's look at, at the following. Let's look at the mean square. I'm going to define the mean square of the gust as equal to 1 over 2 capital T, therefore minus capital T to plus capital T of the time history of the gust squared dt in the limit as capital T goes up the So now, if I have a gust, if you, if you go out and measure the gust field, I think my airplane, your airplane is going to fly through. Then I put that in here and try to compute the mean square. And I do that for various values of capital T. If capital T gets, gets large enough, the answer should be independent of capital T because I'm interviewing from minus T to plus T and then I'm dividing by 1 over 2 T. So this, this quantity should be independent of capital T. If it isn't, it's not a random guess. <laughs> and that's one way to assess whether the test is truly random. If this thing doesn't converge to some constant value as capital T becomes large, it's probably not a random guess. And anyway, who is that? Uh, and, and one way to think about that, you could put in a, a cosine function, right? A periodic function of time and, and evaluate this and see if, it, if it's independent of capital T and the answer is probably not. Okay. By the same token, you can take H or H over C and I can compute the mean square of that. Alright? Same thing. Square it. All right, I'll write Shouldn't, shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be. Uh. Okay. So then the question for the house is, oh, I'll put a bar over here. Uh, the bar simply means that, that we're thinking of this time average. Uh, what is the relationship between this and this? And I think for a long time, people thought there was some magic touch. <laughs> but it turns out that's, that's not true. It, it's much more complicated than that. And, and uh, a fellow named S. O. Rice, who is actually an electrical engineer, uh, who was studying random noise in electrical circuits, and had the same basic challenge, and came up with the method that we use today. And he named it, unfortunately. I mean, if, you're, if you're someone who does something really important, you're usually going to name it, even if it's the name you choose is not, in retrospect, a wonderful name. So he calls this power, because he was dealing with electrical power, spectral because he was dealing with frequencies. And he was thinking of, of, the, of so much power in a certain band of frequency, so he called it power spectral density analysis. 
And everybody else talks about that too, so you might as well accept that. So the idea is the following. To get this relationship, you initially generalize the idea of a, uh, of a mean square. Okay? And you define something called a correlation function, and you can do this for either the test or the output, but let's do it for the test. I'm going to define the correlation function to be 1 over 2t equals minus t t of the gust velocity evaluated times t times the gust velocity evaluated times t plus tau dt. Now, just formally, with that definition, then this thing on, on the left-hand side has to depend on tau, right? If I change tau, I'm going to change the value of the and it's called a correlation function because I'm trying to see how well the signal at one time is correlated with the signal at another time. And if, again, if it's truly random, I expect that p sub g of t goes to zero as tau gets large. That's another way people judge whether you really have a random signal. In fact, you, you can buy a, you can buy a Two hundred dollars, maybe a thousand dollars. You can buy a correlation uh, machine that will go. You see, then the time this is whatever you're interested in, it helps you do the correlation. And uh, and not only that, and by, and by the way, then you can look at the correlation function and see if zero is tending to zero. Now it's not, then you're going to have a random input, right? So, so plan B. The other thing you should note is the piece of WG at tau equals zero. Does, does equal the uh, mean square of the gas, right? So what we're going to end up doing is we're going to find the relationship between the correlation function of the test and the correlation function of the response. And once I find the correlation function of the response, I can set tau to zero and I'm done. But what Rice really did, and I think people knew that before Rice, he said, you know, it would be much easier if we worked in the street to be doing that. How are we going to do that? We're going to take a Fourier transform of the correlation function. So I'm going to find a, 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 a function of frequency, which is equal to the Fourier transform of the correlation function, e to the minus i omega tau t tau from minus infinity to plus infinity. That's the usual definition of a of a uh, uh, Fourier transform. But for reasons entirely to be discovered in a moment, I'm going to put a 1 over pi out in front. Remember before, usually we don't put a 1 over pi. Instead, what we do is there's, there's the other part of the Fourier transform there. The C of WG of tau is equal to the interval from minus infinity to plus infinity of the function of frequency, P to the plus I omega uh, tau D omega, and we put a 1 over 2 pi here, right? I'm just going to put 1 over 2 here and, and put my pi over there. If you think about it, you can, you're just scaling these two functions. I mean, these are just constants, right? I, I, I could, I could, do, and, and so it, the, the, the rule is collectively they get, you have to have a one over two pi. But I could put a one and a half here and a one over pi here, or vice versa. I could put a one over two pi here and a one here, or vice versa. Uh, the, the tradition in Fourier transform theory usually is you put the one over two pi here, but in power spectral density analysis, you, you do one half here. And, why is that? I'm glad you asked. It's because what I really want to do is I really want to compute the correlation function at tau equals zero. Right? So let's do that using this definition. The correlation function at tau equals zero is equal to one half the integral from minus infinity to infinity of V WG of omega tau zero, so the exponential is one, d omega, 
right? But it turns out you can show that the fire spectral chemistry is an even function of omega. So the integral for minus infinity to plus infinity is twice the integral from zero to infinity. And therefore, I just want to integrate from zero to infinity, but then frankly, that gives me a two, which cancels one half. That's why, that's why I normalize things this way. That's why Rice normalized things this way. Okay. So let's give these all some numbers. Uh, I'm going to call that one, two, three. These are just interesting observations. Uh, this is the definition of the power, this is the definition of the power structure this, in terms of the correlation function. And conversely, this is now the correlation function in terms of the uh, power spectrum. And of course, this is equal to the square of the mean square of the, uh, of the in this case, the best velocity. Okay. So now, what, what did what did Rice do that was so wonderful? I'm glad you asked. So we can follow it here. Here's what he did. After four or five pieces of algebra, which are carefully and clearly discussed in my book, he showed that the power spectrum of the response is equal to the transfer function squared times the power spectrum of the input. So what does that mean? That means the way I do random does analysis is I look at sinusoidal input output, determine the transfer function. I square it, multiply it by the power spectrum of the gust, which usually comes from experiment. And we can discuss how you made the power spectrum in a moment. One thing to do is make the correlation function and then have your have I also have a machine that will take a Fourier transform and anything you like and we can do it that way. And then I know the power spectrum of the response. Once I know the power spectrum of the response, I integrate over the frequency, and I have the mean square, and I'm done. Okay? I'm done. Two things. What do I mean by square of the transfer function? Well, the transfer function is a real part function of frequency, plus i times an imaginary part is also a function of frequency. And by the square of the transfer function, I mean it's the real part squared plus the imaginary part squared. Or it's really the transfer function multiplied by its complex conjugate. Okay? That, that's what you mean by the square of, of, of the transfer function. So this is actually a real number. You'll be happy to know that this is a real number. Of course, this is a real number because the mean square response has to be a real number. Okay. So now, huh, it's time to give you the coup de grace, and then we'll talk more about it next time. This is, uh, I'm going to call that question six, for those who can't get scored. This one is the result of seven. And so, what, what does seven mean physically? Think of, here, I, I'm going to plot things versus frequency. The power spectrum of the gust, if it's really a random function, is a slowly varying function of frequency and eventually drops off to zero at very high frequency. The transfer function, because this is a basically a spring mass damper oscillator, is a very resonant system. And the square of the transfer function, particularly because I'm squaring it, has a peak near the resonant frequency and is very small everywhere else. So the transfer function squared looks like this. So almost all of the output power spectra is associated with this peak. In fact, it's, 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 it's so much uh, a result dominated by the peak. When I do that integral over frequency, I essentially set the power spectrum equal to its value at the resonant frequency, and then just integrate the square of the transfer function. So that can be done or a linear model analytically, and if I have 10 nodes, they can be done individually for each of 10 nodes. So all I really need to do is find the resonant frequencies of my system, right? And then life is good. Also, this is a great physical insight. It doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what the power spectrum is away from the resonance. It just matters, the only thing that the gust is going to 
due to the airplane, this flood of precise zero resonance frequency competitor. And so, not only is this, this uh, once you accept that this is a wonderful relationship that provides the source line to do source, then this is, gives you a great deal more physical insight to what's really going on and what's really important. And you avoid doing a lot of time saving, right? So often this is what you see done, not just in gust analysis, but in any kind of uh, analysis which involves a random input to a dynamic system. Now normally, normally this what I've discovered in the last lecture two is, is a subject of almost an entire semester course. But I'm not going to charge you any extra, even though we cover a lot of material in only a few days. Um, I think that's about the last thing I want to say about gust analysis, fire analysis, divergence, and reversal. Now we're going to spend a lot of time talking about unstable dynamics and replacing our simple, simple expressions from that by a much more elaborate expression. And uh, that that story again can carry over several semesters. So what we're going to cover is we're going to cover what I'll call hyperbole, potential flow theory for subsonic, transonic, and supersonic flow, which is still useful. In fact, those are the methods that are used today in most of the most of the time. Uh, if you want to know about properties of good dynamic analysis, you need to take Professor Hall's course. Or Professor Hall's course at Warrentown and they teach them. Very nice question on how to do that. We may say, if we have time, I may say something about it, at least towards the end, in terms of giving you a glimpse of what, what can be done beyond the class. And we will start, so start reading chapter four. We will start with super science flows, which is not historical, right? And Theodore Orson, first grade of answers, very professional. Why are we going to start with super science flows? It's much easier to analyze than even professional. Uh, incompressible order is really hard. <laughs> All right. But Theodore's, unfortunately, has done for us. We're not going to say much about Theodore's theory unless you ask. Because as wonderful and cheap it is, it is, his method applies to two-dimensional flows, not three-dimensional flows. It applies to incompressible flows, but not combustible flows. So it's a dead end intellectually. It's, it's, it's an important dead end to know about historically. And people still use it if you're flying a low speed airplane and Snapman is doing a water analysis. One of their tools is to do a Theodorson based center calculation. Okay. Um, but, but now, even as Snapman, they probably have an expressible <laughs> and three dimensional model uh, as well as an incompressible two dimensional model. So we're going to start off with super Zach flow, 2D, then we'll do super fine flow, 3D. Then we'll do subsonic flow, 3D, real positive D, and subsonic flow. And then I'll explain to you right at the end that everything breaks down when you're in the transonic field. That's the one reason people are doing CFD. Now, where is flutter likely to be most critical? In what lock number is? One. Right. In the transonic region, where the theory is weakest. So that's why people still do it. Okay. <laughs>